What's wrong with you? This. The most requested book? Wait, what? This is the most requested book. No way. Yes way. God knows why. They want you to review Anne of Green Gables? Are you going to do it? I guess I have to. I mean, it's not that bad a book. I just didn't like it when I read it in my freshman year of high school. The plot sucked, and if the fans wanted to I'll do it, I guess. <sighs> Hello and welcome to the Literary Lair. You know what's coming. Let's not prolong the inevitable. Today is... You know what? I've been doing this show for two years, and all good things must come to an end. And I've taken this as far as I can take it. Uh, I don't have anything else planned for today. Um, enjoy this, I guess? Did any of you look at Star Odyssey and wonder, did anything come before this? Well, I guess someone fucking did, because it exists. It's called War of the Robots, and it's equally bad. War of the Robots, aka Reactor, which I think is a horrible name. I much preferred the alternate title for Star Odyssey, which was Seven Gold Men in Space. At least that's sort of true. There's no reactor in this movie, and the actors barely react at all. We start in Space Control, where we learn that a spaceship in Sector H has broken down. A security team is dispatched to reactivate the ship, since it's a crucial link in the worldwide space defense system. Looks like Reagan's Star Wars plan got farther than we thought. Next, we're brought to a dark room, where this woman is making out with her boyfriend. The guy wants to make out more, but she has to get back to work. But they make a date for the next night. The guy is Captain John Boyd of the USS Blue Balls. After Boyd takes his leave, the girl, Lois, returns to her work with... Wait, is that Professor Smith? While a group of gold He-Man impersonators invade the station and make their way to the lab. I've been doing all Meanwhile, this Professor stuff. Smith explains to Lois that I he's on the verge of creating an immortal man. I'm on the verge of discovering a secret that will lead to immense power. Do you understand, Lois? Just think of it. I can create an immortal man. I can grow a forest where there was only desert. So he wants to make the Genesis device from Star Trek? If I want a crazy person trying to wipe out all life with a machine, I'll stick with Ricardo Montalban, thank you very much. Before he can continue with his ranting of his ideas, the gold He-Men storm in and take Professor Smith and Lois prisoner, and whisk them off in outer space. Hey, at least this movie starts off fast. The faster it starts, the faster it ends, and I can watch something better. Boyd's senior officer explains that Smith was on the verge of discovering the secret to the creation of life, which of course he did in his personal atomic reactor. I guess that's why this is called Reactor. It's actually a better title since there is a reactor and I haven't seen any robot wars yet. To make matters worse, the reactor is in danger of a city-destroying meltdown. Since Professor Smith is the only one who knows how to shut the reactor down, Commander King tasks her hero with returning Professor Smith and Lois safely back to Earth. Oh no, we've looped back into the opening credits. With the crew at their stations, the ship takes off to retrieve Lois and Professor Smith. Before heading out into interstellar space, Boyd first stops the ship besides a tracking satellite so we can spacewalk out and retrieve information of the alien ship's speed and direction. Because that was totally necessary and he couldn't have downloaded it remotely. 
After some discussion, Boyd figures that the ship can overtake the aliens in four days. Space Control gives the green light, and Boyd sets off on the mission. And, wait, is that Colin Baker at the helm? Boyd and Julie find time to drink a few space martinis and have a little chat. Their little reenactment of that scene from the cage is interrupted when enemy spaceships appear and attack. They play some Battlestar Galactica stock footage for a bit, and some stiff acting ensues. Boyd is sure that Dr. Smith and Lois are on the third ship, and the computer starts saying numbers and figures that make no sense for space travel. Then we get reaction shots, they shoot the ships down, and then their drive breaks. Back on Earth, Commander King learns that they've lost contact with Boyd. There better not be any grasshoppers in this movie. Finally, after the longest travel scene in an Italian space opera, the ship lands on, a plan on the planet Anthor. What they discover is that Professor Smith and Lois aren't captives. The reason the rulers of Anthor ordered their He-Man robots to kidnap the scientists is that they're afraid of death. Wait a minute, Colin Baker looking guy, people wanting immortality, is this a lost episode of Doctor Who? If so, I think I finally found something worse than love and monsters. Back to the <clears throat> plot. Professor Smith is the only man in the universe who can make them immortal. In the center of the underground city, the professor has constructed an immortality machine made out of an old Commodore 64. Turns out that Lois is now the Empress of Anthor. How long have they even been there? But Lois still wants John. She helps the ship's crew escape by double-crossing Professor Smith. But Lois doesn't just want John. She also wants to rule the universe. And the fact that John is a part of that universe is added value. The ship is boarded by robots and two separate battles for the control of the bridge take place. The humans win and Lois puts on a spacesuit and jumps out of the airlock to be rescued by a flying saucer. An invasion force from Anthor is following them back to Earth. John immediately orders his crew to their battle stations. The ship and their fighters is the only thing standing between Lois and Space Command. Really? This is like in Star Trek, when the Enterprise is the only fucking ship in range. So, Boyd and a couple of other guys fly out in fighters so they can use more stock footage and try to take down the Anthorians. After some confusing editing, Lois refuses the, to surrender, and Boyd kills her. They launch some torpedoes that destroy the Anthorian fleet, and Boyd says that everything is fantastic. And then they return to Earth to disarm the reactor. Or not. The movie just fucking ends. Not that I'm disappointed, I'm happy it's over. But why call it Reactor if they never shut down the reactor? This movie was a waste of my time. It wasn't as interesting as Turkish Star Wars, and I could have been watching a better Italian Star Wars ripoff, like Star Crash. At least that movie had David Hasselhoff in it. And now I have to answer the question that you've had since this review started. Why the fuck am I a teenager? <laughs>